Welcome everybody to our uh, to our Learn Fast webinar series. We've been doing these since March of 2020 and uh, and having a really good time. Uh, been enjoying them. We've got. Uh, uh, folks have been coming in and co-hosting with us, and uh, and today is uh, no difference. There we've got Peter Kraus from from Peter Kraus and Associates, and he is uh, here for his fifth his fifth visit today. We'll talk a little bit about Peter in just a second with a with a contact slide and have him tell us a little bit more about himself. But today, what we're going to talk about is data in non ECU race vehicles. The um, uh, most of us, uh, many of us have the opportunity to, to do a quick connection to our car, whether it be, you know, CAN or K-Line or, 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 you know, serial or, uh, you know, through the OBD2 port. Uh, but uh, some of us don't, especially the, the vintage historic uh, community and, you know, and spec Miatas and, and race cars, you know, kit cars that people have built that may not have an ECU or may not have that connection. Or they've got a race car that the, they've been around for, they don't want to do that, uh, that large, uh, that, that bit of work to to connect it and make sure it's all going, we, we have some options for you to still get what many people think is about, and um, you, you can get 80% of your way in, in, in data analysis with some of these basic channels, RPM and just the GPS channel, so, which we've talked about a little bit in previous webinars. So we're going to, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about this data in these, uh, these non-ECU race vehicles today and, uh, and get a better handle on what's available out there, how to add a sensor to a, to a system, and, and maybe what, uh, what sensors are important. So uh, with that, let's let's jump up to the next slide and um, and introduce our co-host today. Peter, Peter's been here with us, um, you know, uh, this is his fifth time. And um, we have, uh, uh, but, but by the way, this, uh, this presentation materials, we, we're going to do everything inside the presentation materials today. There will be a link in the chat box here for those of us who are here live that, uh, that you can download off of our servers. Open it up if you want to follow along. If you're watching this later in, um, on YouTube, uh, down in the description box, all of the links that we're going to talk about today uh, are going to be in the, in the description box as well. So keep that in mind if you want to uh, download this, uh, this uh, uh, presentation or any of the stuff that Peter talks about today that we have links for, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get a good uh, uh, list of those links below. Okay, Peter, again, thank you for being here. I know there's a lot of work and a lot of time that goes into these things to, to, to do these right, and, uh, and I certainly appreciate it. Uh, Peter has been a, a friend of uh, a friend of AIM for for quite a long time, a dealer, and um, uh, we've been doing uh, at on-site uh, seminars at uh, at his shop at VIR uh, so, you know, since uh, you know the last five or, five or six. Yeah. Is it ten years now? It's been it's been a while, <laughs> I know. And uh, and a lovely place, obviously, uh, not Peter's shop, uh, although it's nice enough. But Virginia International Raceway is a is a lovely part of the country that I really like to to visit anyway. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about you and uh, and how you got here, and uh, and then uh, we'll kind of just roll into where we're going to go today. Well, thanks so much, Roger. You know, this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, different ways to look at data and, and different ways to use information. Uh, I am, uh, obviously my name is Peter Krause. I am, uh, uh, I was a shop owner for 25 years, uh, prepared and restored older cars, BMWs, historic race cars, Ferraris, Alfa Romeo, uh, Maserati, Lamborghini, that sort of thing. And uh, sold my shop in 2007 and decided to work full time with club level drivers, track day drivers and HPDE drivers uh, to do better uh, using technology. And uh, I'm a multi-line dealer. I carry a lot of different brands. Uh, AIM has got some great uh, market penetration. The real game changer for me was the Solo uh, when it originally came out in 2011. Uh, but before that, the Smarty Cam was really uh, a game changer for me because it was the first thing that actually recorded information on the background of the video. And that was really important to me because then I could put it up in front of somebody that I was working with and say, hey, look, uh, we're both looking at the same thing. And, and so that worked out really well. I've been uh, very, very, my focus is historic and vintage cars because I find them interesting. I find them beautiful. I find them rare. I find the people that own them are very interesting, uh, very smart, very successful people, obviously. Uh, they're really, you know, it's, it's just really a lot of fun. Uh, the background uh, behind me is uh, a race start uh, last uh, September at Virginia International Raceway. And uh, between David Free and I, we have about half of the field uh, <laughs> equipped with AIM data in, in the cars in the background. So it works out really well. Uh, but we've, I've had an opportunity to work with some great 
great cars. And uh, on this slide, you can see uh, on the left-hand side is the center tunnel of a, uh, a car near and dear to Matt Romanowski's heart. <laughs> and a uh, big shout out to him for a great uh, Speed Secrets Weekly article today uh, from Ross Bentley, Speed Secrets. Matt Romanowski is the guest columnist and he talked about organizing data. Now that you've collected it, how do you store it, archive it, keep it, back it up? So that was really cool. Anyway, 914.6 GT on the left-hand side, we have a real uh, AC289 Cobra in the center with a nice little uh, Smarty Cam GP um, <clears throat> version 2.1 aimed out the front. And then we have two of the finest sports racing cars in the world on the right-hand side sitting in one bay at Watkins Glen Raceway a couple of years ago at the SVRA event. Greg Galdi's uh, 917K uh, in the background, number four, and the my favorite sports racing car of all time, the 312 PB Ferrari from 1972, uh, number 87. But uh, it's a, a subject near and dear to my heart. This is not, we're not going to talk about analysis. We're not going to talk about any of that. We're just going to talk about architecture overview, uh, sort of an order of things, at least from my experience and my perspective. It's not right or it's not wrong. Uh, Roger's going to obviously weigh in and, and we have a whole bunch of other people, but this is a great thing. And uh, it's, I've asked a lot of people and extended invites in social media to a lot of drivers with uh, cars older than say 2002, uh, spec Miatas, spec Boxsters and PCA club racing, vintage and historic race cars, E36 BMW M3s, that sort of thing. Uh, they are not missing out because they can't connect to an ECU. And that is the number one message I want to talk about today. Yeah. Thank you. And, and as Peter and I were, uh, were uh, talking a little bit yesterday, the, uh, that picture in the lower right with the Ferrari and the Porsche, the, uh, uh, the, the, the 917 to me is the, is, is the classic race car, classic sports car, right? Uh, that and the 962 Porsches were, were an era that I watched a lot to, in, in real time. So Peter, Peter had his favorite and I had my favorite in, these, in this one screen here. So that was, uh, that was kind of funny. So yeah, it's kind of cool, cool stuff. Related. In the beginning, <laughs> there you and there you go, Peter. Uh, des describe that. Uh, describe the you know a little bit about where we're kind of heading with this picture, this great picture that you found. So this picture was really cool. I mean, it's uh, obviously it's from the Donahue collection, but it's it's in uh, Paul Van Valkenburg's book uh, about early race car engineering, professional race car engineering, which was a bible for me when I started working on cars forty years ago, and. Um, it's a great picture of Mark Donahue, who was a trained engineer, um, and he was in his Trans Am uh, car in his Camaro at the Millbrook Testing Grounds uh, at GM with a huge uh, recorder in the passenger seat in a cardboard box with some packing around it. And uh, I mean, this is how it started. It's, it's really amazing. The reference to wheels were made of wood. A uh, great friend, uh, Bruce McGinnis, longtime chief instructor for Skip Barber, he talks about back when wheels were made of wood and we started racing. This is what uh, early tech looked like. And thankfully, we don't have to do that. But this, this, uh, this whole idea of data in historic cars and non-ECU cars has been around for a long time. And that is the picture uh, that this represents. Yeah, I'm not uh, speaking of tech, uh, taking that a different direction. I'm not sure that would pass tech, right? That, you know, they want to, they want things tied <laughs> down maybe a little bit better than that, but when you're testing and, uh, and it's 1968, that's a, that's an interesting story. Anybody that wants to talk about some of the old school data, data systems and, and some, some other things we had a, um, a, a webinar uh, recently, we had Larry McReynolds from the NASCAR world on, and he talked about some of the testing that he did in, in NASCAR, the cup series uh, early on uh, some uh, no, no pictures like that, but uh, some, some pretty cool stories from him. If, uh, if you look back in our, in our YouTube videos, you'll find the Larry McReynolds video. So kind of, kind of cool history stuff. I like, the, I love that part. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There you so, go. you know, one of the things I wanted to, uh, you did a really good job. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we've been going back and forth and Rogers really helped me tweak this presentation a great deal. And uh, I respect and enjoy uh, very much James Colborn's take on data. His, uh, he's very open and, and really, really good about sharing information and, and ways to look at it that are simple and clean. And I'm really not um, <clears throat> interested in making things more complex. They're complex enough as they are at the racetrack. But James has really sort of distilled his journey uh, through 
uh, data. And he started with the name Solo. He, he used the device for 10 years, got good information around, went better, uh, put an MXL Pista, which came out in 2004 um, on, his, on its older, I think it was his uh, Pro, Pro 3 spec car, which is a, a, a non-ECU car. And uh, they did, you know, basic inputs, throttle, brake, uh, front and back, uh, RPM, oil, water, um, oil pressure and temp. And, and so what he was doing was he was looking at the GPS data and his driving information, but he was also looking at the health of the car. And that's what we talked about. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Then uh, right around the cusp of being able to get usable information from ECU cars was uh, around 2001, 2002, when the uh, E46 BMW came on the scene. And of course, he bought one of those. And that was a, that's a great series. It's a huge series. We'll revisit some of this in a moment uh, because uh, James uh, Colborn, James Clay, and I put together a guide for people that were using Spec E46. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But here, what he did was he added video and he said it changed his world. And to me, that is super important because I think a lot of people are very visual learners. And I think the information on the background of the video, which the logger can present to the camera, is really important. So this is a system that is used together to get the kind of information. So uh, finally, <clears throat> I think it's really fun uh, watching you know Matt and James talk about tire pressures and ways people learn and and you know their presentations are remarkably visual, even if it is scatter plots and strip charts. So it works well. Um, this this is really fun, uh, and and he basically closes this whole thing by saying, "I forget that I'm not looking at ECU CAN bus data in my Ford." And so Roger hit the nail right on the head, and he said, "Data is data," and the way that you get it. I just want people to know that if they, even if they don't have an ECU, even if they don't have a two wire hookup, even if they don't plug into a, uh, a CAN connection at the OBD2 plug, they've still got access to this. All they need to do is take the time to put in the sensors. James has been a great uh, co-host with us on, on, on many different uh, uh, webinars here with us. And I just, just love having him join us. He was our, our, our uh, co-host just last week. Uh, we'll put a link up into the, into the chat box and, and description below for James's YouTube site. He, he does a ton of uh, additional training, including one, uh, one video that I, 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 I took a look at really quickly just last night where he talks about uh, uh, how worthy, how, how, uh, how, how great is uh, uh, just a solo, just, just the, the, the regular solo to bringing it into a car, what kind of data can you get, what, uh, how does that help you, and uh, uh, I'm sure the guys will link that in the, in the chat box here in just a moment. That was, uh, that was a, a really good video. I thought everybody would like to take a look at that. Uh, you know, there it is, episode one of his uh, vlog. Um, we'll put that link down below as well, so. Let's jump you to the next slide, and and uh, and really, here is the bottom line of where we're talking, right? Data is data. We just we just mentioned that, yeah. right? And uh, and like you've got a data logger, and or maybe you don't have anything, and you're just trying to figure this out. How do we get data? And how for us to analyze later? Well, exactly. And and the nice thing about this is um, one of the greatest things about AIM Sports products is the systems are completely modular. You can be as mild or wild as you like, and there are always ways to add more. Uh, on this slide is really nice because we have analog inputs, which are variable voltage uh, inputs and temperature inputs. We have speed or pulse uh, inputs, wheel speeds. Uh, we have digital uh, outputs, which would be information from the logger that lights a light or turns a fan on or controls a power consumer. We have Wi-Fi connectivity, the ability to offload the information and intake the configurations uh, wirelessly, which is fantastic. I mean, it's really, really good. You have the memory module, which is a great, easy way to take physical data away very quickly when you don't have time to download and review the information or share it to somebody. Channel expansions. Uh, these devices are analog to digital converters. And what they do is they can be daisy chained uh, up to, I think, 256 channels, analog channels, uh, or the bandwidth of the logger, 
uh, to get that good information. The GPS module, which is uh, essential to the track location, position, and mostly an accurate speed representation of what the car is going to be, as, long, as well as the location of the car on the track. Um, we are not focusing today on ECU or, or CAN on the bottom, uh, uh, CAN2 generally an output or another input, uh, because a lot of the cars that we work on don't have that capability. So that's where we're moving towards. But many different data sources are available, and sensors are one of them, ECU is another one. Uh, but it's all interrelated and it's a great ecosystem. What, what is really cool as you started off this panel with is, is uh, yeah, the Solo is not too expandable, but uh, you can plug in a couple things in the Solo 2 DL, but um, the, many of our systems, you, you get it, you can use it just like it is, maybe throw a couple of sensors at it that we're going to talk about. And then down the road, if you get another car that has those, uh, those vehicle data streams, we can connect to that as well. Kind of a, kind of a cool way of looking at it. And, and a lot of people upgrade, you know, a lot of people start with older cars, they pull their lo logger out, they get a newer car, they stick it in, have fun. We have options for, for the future for you. So this, this is really fun. This chart is really uh, a lot of fun because James uh, Clay, James Colburn and I spent a lot of time uh, testing this when there wasn't a lot of information available early on. This was right after the MXL uh, two was introduced in uh, the uh, end of 2014. And uh, we had uh, a bunch of people that wanted data for a particular car, and uh, but they had different budget and price points they were trying to do. And they frankly had different needs and requirements. So a full-blown person that was looking for uh, to monitor oil pressure or fuel pressure to help in troubleshooting or diagnosis um, needed to know that if they bought an AIM Solo DL and connected it to the ECU, that that wouldn't get that information. So this is a really, really good slide that, that basically shows you the progression from a AIM Solo or AIM Solo 2. This was, again, back in 2014. So we're talking about the old stuff, uh, the first generation stuff. But, but this was a great tool. And, and the Solo and the Solo DL have become so ubiquitous at that point and so valuable to people <laughs> that we felt like it was important to say, okay, this is what the solo will and won't do. This is what the solo DL will and won't do with this car. This is what the MXL2 or the MXG or the Evo 4S or the Evo, uh, Evo 4 at that time uh, will do or won't do. And uh, it's all color coded. It was a lot of fun, uh, but this, this can go for a lot of different cars. I saw a comment about a 996 GT3 Porsche doesn't provide much information. Well, no, it doesn't. But uh, if it is 2002 and later, what happens is you can uh, use the Porsche 996 911 uh, CAN protocol and then add a couple of sensors. So it works out very, very well. And, um, and it is expandable, just like it shows in this chart. Okay. where Where is the... Where is the we've got a car that doesn't have something and a lot as a lot of the folks that are watching here today kind of the focus of this one what, what's a simple solution for getting some data right uh, kind of linked back to where if you if you scroll back up in the in, in the chat box those of you watching live uh, is the solo uh, a worthy device of of uh, of doing this can will the solo do what i'm after uh talk to us a little bit about the solo too and what it can do for you well just for a second i mean i uh, everybody needs to understand that I am looking primarily at driver performance improvement. So one of the key uh, functions that the Solo 2 provides is predictive lap timing that validates whether a driver is doing better or not as well. Uh, taking one approach to a corner, a track, a gear selection, then another. It can show this information both numerically and in the LEDs that are color coded red or green when they're ahead or behind of their previous best lap. They can also measure all the forces acting on the car, which is really, really important. Um, so, so I think that the, that the Solo 2 is a really great basic tool that historic drivers can use, historic car drivers can use to get basic information. Uh, I wanna do a big plug again for James Colborn's switches 
I have seen wonderful work from Emiliano and his team integrating a lot of these maths into Ray Studio 3 analysis. So it works really, really well. And uh, uh, it's, it's important. The reason I show an E36 M3 lightweight is because I was fortunate enough to buy one of these 125 cars that was sent to North America and drive it off the showroom floor at Hendrick BMW in uh, February of 1996. And we had it at the racetrack at Roebling Road a week later. And I love these cars. They're great cars. Not a lot of information available, but a Solo 2 works great. Yeah, and there's, uh, as James's uh, uh, video, is the Solo 2 all you really need? If you watch that video, it comes down to, in, in most cases, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. And we're going to go through a little bit of that here as we, as we move forward in the next few slides. Yeah. The next solution, maybe it's the next step, right? You've got your driver needs, you've got your your basic GPS channels and accelerometer stuff from the from the standard solo. Now the standard solo DL. If it, we're going to talk about what is uh, what is that providing for the user and and what uh, what can we get out of that? The next step up. So one of the big improvements that the solo two DL brought along after the first gen was the ability to accept a square wave RPM signal. And the RPM signal allowed uh, better triggering options. It allowed this information to be transmitted uh, and, and streamed to the Smarty Cam uh, for display on the background of the video. So all of a sudden you could sit there and say, uh, you know, yes, the gear selection was correct. No, the gear selection wasn't correct. All of a sudden you had a whole nother level of information that was capable. Plus you had an automated video solution. I don't know how many people call me and say, God, I hate my GoPro because the battery always dies or it quits working. And, and that honestly drives a lot of Smarty Cam sales. But the combination of the Solo 2DL and the Smarty Cam is, is absolutely the one-two punch for somebody just getting into something that uh, is not, in my mind, uh, terribly expensive, but provides great value. And uh, for older cars, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, Boxsters, Porsche Boxsters, the spec Boxster class is limited to cars between 97 and, uh, and 99. And the difficulty with that is that there's not a lot of useful, hardly any information that is accessible. So a really simple solution would be an RPM signal power and ground, and then a connection to a Smarty Cam. This is true for Spec Miata NAs. This is true for a lot of different cars, even the NB, which doesn't provide, again, a useful or frequently refreshed stream of information from the car that makes the data usable. Through the ECU connection, but there, but by just ordering, if you order a Solo 2, you have some options on which harness you get, and one of them will take that that direct RPM link. Andy had a question earlier in the question and answer box. I'm sure it was answered, but he was talking about the different RPM sources. We can connect to the coil or you know the square wave you know signal coming uh, you know heading to the standard tech and inside the car and grab RPM in a in a Solo 2 DL and and every device above that as well. So perfect. Now I will say for uh, for some historic racing cars, particularly the Ford powered cars, for some reason, Formula Ford, Kent powered push rod, uh, the Sports 2000 cars, Formula Continentals, like the car, uh, like the cars in my background uh, of, the, of the video, these cars do require additional filtering, which is an RPM conditioner, which is available from AIM and very recommended if the signal is overly noisy. And uh, it is, I, my understanding is that it's an optoelectronic device uh, that, that basically allows an isolation between the noisy voltage signal and the conditioned signal that is sent out of it to the logger. Uh, but but be, don't get worried uh, if, if your RPM is erratic or your shift lights are erratic on any of the loggers from these older Ford powered generally uh, historic cars uh, without first putting an RPM conditioner on it. That is a great way to fix that. Yeah, chat with your local dealer if you're having a, a noisy RPM signal. We uh, we we have these uh, these devices in in uh, you know, literally tens of thousands of cars, right? And we've uh, we may have ran probably have ran into the problem you have, and we probably have a solution. So give us a holler, right? We'll uh, we'll have our contact information there at the end of the of the of the broadcast or your local dealer, obviously. 
So the next, the next step, right? The next step. Let's now. Now we've built into this. So we had that solo two, then the solo two DL, and now maybe you've maybe you've gotten in there and uh, you don't have a car that doesn't have a you know, doesn't have those that that vehicle data stream, and yet you want a throttle position or a you know a brake pressure or something. You know, this is where you're getting into that territory where if you think that's something you might want to do, these are the kind of devices you may want to do. And we're gonna, and this is not a sales thing. This is just giving you some ideas of what's out there and how this process works for those of you that are uh, uh, with cars without the, that ECU stream. And then we're, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about different sensors and how to mount sensors and some other things here in, uh, in just a few slides. The next step, Peter, what, uh, what, what are we looking at here? And what does it do for the, for the racer? So one of the cool things is the, the introduction of the MXM, sort of a beefed up uh, based on the Solo 2 DL architecture uh, is a really, really great device at a reasonable price point. I had uh, a lot of people who had older uh, XG logs and Micron 3s and things like that who wanted to upgrade to GPS and they only had a couple of sensors. Uh, they wanted to add the Smarty Cam and this was the perfect thing to plug right in to a Sports 2000 or Formula Continental or Formula Ford or Spec Miata. And it's been very popular with the Spec Miata crowd, very popular with the Spec Boxster crowd because it's simple. It does uh, require that you make some choices on the maximum number of analog sensors, which is four, and the expansion capability. It's not possible to add a channel expansion to this uh, to add more uh, analog sensors, uh, doesn't have wheel speeds, doesn't have any of that stuff. And the reason why is because it's simple, straightforward, and at a very reasonable price point. But it does have some really useful features, which include a Lambda control unit uh, expansion capability, and of course, the Smarty Cam. So it has an integral uh, GPS antenna array on, on the top. It has shift lights, it has uh, two conditioned alarms, so it's really quite a bit of power in a little package. And especially for cars that have a really, really tight uh, geography where they can put stuff in, this is a really good tool, really good. And, and it has four analog sensors and, and to kind of start to wrap this around of what, what people typically want, right? The, the, um... We we we're putting these in race cars, and a lot of people really want those that that vehicle health sensor that we've listed here. Really, oil pressure and water temperature are critical uh, in most cars that have you know that are they're water cooled at least. And uh, and now they've got a couple of sensors left, simple a couple of uh, ports left for sensors. Well, we've got listed here. Uh, you and I chatted about it. You know, Maybe different for some folks, but kind of a the, the basic suggestion of a throttle position and brake pressure if, for that driver analysis stuff. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about the, the, the sensor package that uh, most people are getting with this. Well, and then this is the most common one. Now, of course, if you had an air-cooled car, uh, air-cooled car or bike, what you would do is you'd choose oil pressure and oil temperature as opposed to water temperature. Some people, and, and you had this discussion last night, that uh, it might be more useful because you can derive a pretty accurate representation of decelerative forces with the accelerometers and GPS longitudinal acceleration, might want to substitute a steering angle sensor for the brake pressure sensor. So there are ways to mix and match this to get the good information out of it. Again, what's really cool is, is it's, it's definable by the user. What, what's important to you, let's, you, you, you select what you want. And it's uh, uh, maybe, maybe for a while you stick it in the car and it's just the GPS stuff and, uh, and running the camera, right? Uh, and then you have the ability to step up and add things as you think you need them. So that's uh, pretty flexible. That's right. that's right. And I've had a lot of people buy just the device, uh, work off the, uh, you know, add the camera, and then add sensors later on. So, so it is a way to do it, Perfect. to build it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let me do that. There we go. Next, video is data is, is the topic of this one. And uh, uh, story is, as, as I was getting into data and I had a young son that was racing, uh, you know, carts and then cars and, and, um, and I wasn't super good at the data yet. And, and we started to put, we, we, we plugged in the, uh, the original, one of our original AIM video solutions. And I was seeing things in my video that I was not seeing in the data. And then I learned a lot more about data because you could see, see the car understeering or see the car have a entry oversteer, whatever it happened to be, right? And having video, uh, to me, I've always 
chatted with people about this. Uh, video really is data. There is a lot of valuable information that you can get out of video. As, and uh, so there's some, some kind of cool little tips down here. I know you got a couple of stories about uh, video and data. Well, I've, absolutely. You know, I mean, a lot of uh, historic racing venues, especially in Europe, and I have a large number of American customers that go to the UK, to the Europe, uh, to Europe, to Down Under uh, for uh, Formula 5000 races, that sort of thing. And many competitive historic racing series do not allow the addition of sensors or data logging equipment in the car. So a very popular way around this is to add an RPM uh, bridge, which supplies power and engine RPM to the Smarty Cam. But the greatest gift from Race Studio 3 Analysis Beta is the ability to look at very basic measures that the camera is rendering and encoding to the video uh, in along with synced video in Race Studio 3 Analysis Beta so that you can look at the money channels like speed, like longitudinal G, like RPM, and, and get 80% of where you need to be, especially when you're comparing good drivers against great drivers, uh, you, can, you can really get a lot of good information about that. So this is a wonderful way to add uh, video to a historic vehicle and get a lot more using Race Studio 3 Analysis Beta. Also, uh, some of the very old cars like the Indy Lights uh, and, and cart cars, Indy cars, the Marches, the Lolas, a lot of the old uh, Le Mans prototypes, a Group C cars, which I spent a lot of time with, 956s, 962s, uh, Chevy Marches, things like that, 83Gs. They have integral loggers that don't have access to GPS. So this is a very simple way to add not only video, but GPS capability. And if you wanted to, you could add a, a data hub and uh, add a small display and show on the visor, on the dash display, lap times. Um, so that, that can work very well too. Yeah, kind of a cool way to kind of get into data if uh, if your if your car doesn't have all the processes to do that, and and this is just a great first step. You ever most people like or want to have some sort of video process. This gives you some data data overlay. Plus the channels are as you mentioned uh, in in the new Race Studio three analysis package. We actually get some of those data channels. Uh, any data channel you bring up and, and show on the video is being stored to be uh, viewed as data in the in the uh, as squiggly lines as we call it, right? So. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Smarty Cam video and Race Studio Three. We were just chatting about that. Uh, the uh, uh, kind of a cool picture, but uh, the, <laughs> you can look at that data, and we're, we're going to have a, you know, a little bit of a, a preview chat here. But our our next webinar next week will be update uh, with with our friend Emiliano from uh, from AIM Italy is going to come on, and we're going to chat about the up uh, recent updates to uh, Race Studio Three analysis, the beta software that's out there right now that we're all using. So uh, some pretty cool stuff that's coming yeah i would say that that in my uh real world coaching experience at the racetrack this is perhaps the most powerful way to present information to people who are not looking at this information every day like i do so so it's really really good this is just a a great picture of steve lake uh the uk distributor and he's sitting at his desk uh showing basically uh some basic information together with Synced video, but really he doesn't nice. doesn't have his Hans on. the um, The display though is uh, uh, I've I've been thinking about one of those curved displays. I think the prices have come down a ton. I uh, yeah, I'm still uh, I'm still intrigued by that rather than my two or three monitors that we uh, that we run. I'll, I'll think about that more. The, a bad picture for me uh, financially to look at. <laughs> so. <laughs> We, we get the question a lot and uh, and we, we you and I Peter chatted as we were kind of preparing these slides and we had some more more information and we didn't really want to go down the road of the the the, the vehicle uh, data stream stuff too much but there's a lot of questions when people are talking about data streaming into uh, and around the, the aim devices we've got that engine data you know that um, that I'm sorry that vehicle data stream that's coming into the cars and then we've got another can network typically in can uh, can bus network and then we've got another 
proprietary CAN network that AIM is using. A lot of people get that confused, and I know you wanted to chat a little bit about that and, and uh, give some of these folks that maybe are fairly new at this uh, data moving around and, and why this is important to understand. Yeah, yeah and, and <clears throat> that, that's part of the issue is we as AIM support people, all, uh, all the people that interface with users every day uh, need to be clear uh, and explain the fact that there is a, a controller area network, a uh, conversation that uh, goes on between devices that we don't necessarily want to intermingle with the sensors connected to it or other networks or even the ECU. So this is a great way to uh, connect multiple AIM devices together. And uh, that is, again, the purpose and the difference between a data hub and a channel expansion. I mean, you know, that's a question we get all the time. And it's just so important to realize that this is part of the modularity and the expandability of AIM components, where you can mix and match and really build something that uh, is customizable for your needs. And a lot of people, you know, the, the, we have that shorthand, that short language that, that we always talk about data coming in from the car, it, it can data coming in from the, from the ECU. And then when you're chatting with somebody that doesn't understand it fully yet, and then we'll say, okay, and, and we're going to plug in a, a smarty cam, you got to plug it into the, the AIM CAN network, that there is, it is really two distinct things. And, and we keep that one, that AIM proprietary CAN network for just AIM devices. And it makes everything so much cleaner and easier for us and powerful for the user that uh, you can plug in your camera and it just works, right? And, and it grabs the right data at the right time and, and puts and builds the overlay. It grabs the Lambda controller data or we can add an expansion and it just works. So I just wanted a quick slide on the on, on that proprietary CAN network for everybody to understand that if they're if they're walking down that road. So perfect. Okay, now now we've we've uh, we, we, we talk a little bit about and it's going to kind of maybe fit into Chuck's question here just a little bit, Peter, that uh, maybe you can add to this slide as you're talking about it. It's a discussion that we've had a few times before in other webinars, and we don't want to spend a ton of time on what is the best, you know, the best sensors for you to add first. But, uh, you know, chat a little bit about selecting and adding sensors and kind of work uh, Chuck's question in. Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, again, talk from my experience and my point of view, which is how do we take this information and not use it as a tattletale, but use it as a tool for driver improvement? The most important sensor to me is not even, uh, well, most of the loggers do have an RPM input. So that's, I don't consider that part of the sensor complement. That's how I look at and it. And I don't well. consider the GPS information or speed a channel. Right. Uh, most of that equipment is ready. So there's no issue with that. If you were going to start adding sensors, I think the money sensor is the throttle position sensor. And the reason why is in every motorized vehicle that is used for pleasure or competition, the throttle position is a window into the driver's mind for their confidence, competence, and, and just capability. And if you see breeze and you see uh, lackadaisical application and lackadaisical release, then, then those are things that you can fix quickly that will improve speed without adding more risk. So throttle position to me, number one. Uh, the next thing probably uh, would be a health sensor and that would be oil pressure because oil pressure is like blood pressure. If you don't have it, you're dead in the water. So, uh, so that, that, that is, is really an issue. And, you know, I, I, I love folks like David Free, who is, a, who is an extraordinarily gifted and experienced uh, car chief builder. Uh, and he's sitting there saying, you know, I'll put, the, I'll put the driver stuff in, but I want to see the health stuff first. Yeah. Because how many times have I, has he had a driver come in and say, I don't know when the thing quit. You know, I don't, I don't know when the thing started pissing coolant out of the bottom of it. So, so the part of the deal is, is, is uh, you have to decide what you want. I want driver inputs because that is the greatest variable. If the car runs, the car runs, but the driver can always get better. So throttle and brake to me is super important. 
Uh, and then of course, oil temperature and, and, and water temperature for a, a water cooled car. Yeah, the, 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 there's so many users out there with so many different needs that, uh, yeah, you and I and, and David can have a, have a, what we think is the best, but in reality, maybe that car has a good, you know, water temperature, oil pressure gauge, you know, analog, uh, you know, gauge up on the dash because they're they're just thinking of getting into data, and their need is going to be maybe a little bit different. So we all just have to sit down, talk to our dealer, talk to us on, on our 800 tech line, and uh, give me a holler, or whatever, and chat through what your needs are, and we and we figure out what the right sensor is, or right sensors are and, for you and in the right again, order. We'll talk a little bit more about this a little later, but the, the idea that you have to buy a sensor isn't necessarily true for overlap vehicles. When I say overlap vehicles, I mean the NV Miata or the 951, the, the Porsche 944 Turbo or the Corvette C5. Even though no information, readable information comes through, there are still actual potentiometers or voltage dividers that tell their ECU where the throttle is. And if you just pick that voltage division up, you can convert what is already on the car into a usable sensor to your aim logger. So that's important too. Perfect. Here is what you know. What sensors? Uh, what sensors are available? Uh, just about anything you need, really, right? So, and here you, we've we've kind of been chatting about the and and uh, about the the main point of this slide. But there are some some of the sensors that are available. It's not just ECU ECU data streams that can give us you know some of these things. Some of the car data streams, you know, all of these sensors are available to you with a with an analog sensor on a name on a name uh, logger. Well, that's what's really fun is, I mean, basically you can go top left to bottom right, uh, but in no particular order, depends on what you what you want and what you need. I think I've learned the greatest uh, information about uh, suspension displacement from John Block. I think I've learned the most about tire pressures and tire temps from George Seegers and from Matt Romanowski. Uh, so... I've learned more about uh, wheel speeds for tracking traction and, and slip uh, from George, uh, from, from Seegers. Um, and I will give a shout out to Jay Lutz, who, who rightly brings up the fact that there are reference standard books like Buddy Faye's Data Power that have the top seven sensors. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really important. And, uh, <laughs> So, you know, we, we talk about, I, I saw pitot tubes pop up <laughs> for aerodynamic studies. And I think that's more about, you know, engineering the car and of course, true airspeed and a bunch of other stuff, but uh, could have added I it, don't, though. I, I don't, mean, it, it, they do have an analog output, so we could have added it to the list too. So That's for so, sure. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, TechSense makes a really nice little rig that I put on a couple of Porsches and uh, it's worked out very well. So uh, <laughs> this is, it, the sky is the limit. Um, this information can be uh, gotten from any car or any bike or any motorized vehicle. The sky is the limit, really. Yeah, if the sensor's already on there, like you mentioned, we, yeah, there, there's an opportunity to, to check in and see if we can tap into the data. Or if you don't have uh, the whole point of this entire webinar, if you don't have uh, data coming from the car, we, we can add other sensors or tap into existing uh, sensors that are on the car. And there's just a, a brief list of what some of those are. Okay. Uh, here's a little bit about what you were just chatting about. I, I, these next few slides are kind of interesting to me. I uh, visually uh, got some sensor mounts and some sensor kits. Uh, we talk about adding a sensor, and then you also talk about that throttle sensor wire connection for throttle or brake sensors. Uh, give us a little bit of detail on this slide. Yeah, so I mean, the, the big issue uh, is uh, there's not a lot of pictures and a lot of information out on the actual installation of sensors because there are so many applications. But this just gives you a very good idea. On the left-hand side, we see the center tunnel of a Porsche 911. Uh, we see a nice little L bracket of aluminum with a 10-inch uh, string pot uh, mounted in the center. And it goes up to the right-hand side of the throttle pedal. It's protected by a, a, a small plate. Uh, and it's connected at the same point that the throttle uh, cable is connected to. So uh, that is very important, and that works out very, very well. Uh, super important to uh, make that as uh, protected and sheltered as possible. I prefer putting throttle position sensors in the, engine, uh, the driver compartment as opposed to the engine compartment. That way, often, 
Uh, the movement of the pedal is not changed when the engine is removed and reinstalled. That sometimes helps. Save a little bit of time, works out well. The center picture is a, a car that is 60 years old. And uh, it has a throttle position uh, sensor, which is in the center of the screen. And what happens is when this is a accelerator pedal treadle, which means that it is pivoting right underneath the aluminum panel uh, that you can see. And uh, the top of it is moving right to left. And so uh, that is pulling the, the uh, string out from the sensor and giving good information there. We also see a T for the brake pressure sensor. Uh, and that uh, is, is by itself on the right-hand side, something built for the NB spec Miatas, the 1.8s. And it works out super, works out really well. Um, so it, it, it works out great. And, uh, and these are just, just a couple of examples. Just some examples about. of ways to add these sensors if it's, uh, if it's what you choose to add. So kind of, kind of right. some cool pictures. Uh, maybe let's talk about some. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna focus on the oil pressure side, but uh, it, this really is a, a pressure sensors overall. So, you know, some good information about that. Well, one of the cool things was I think a lot of people don't add sensors because they think it's a pain in the ass to do so. So part of the issue is uh, on the left hand side, the left picture, uh, the spec boxer, the ninety seven and ninety nine cars only come with a brake light switch. So if the pressure goes below, it closes to ground a wire and lights up an idiot light on the dash. Well, if you install a 996 combination oil temperature, oil pressure gauge uh, or sensor, I'm sorry, like is pictured here, uh, you can get that information out of one port on the engine galley, oil galley, and gives you very easy information. Unscrew one, screw in another, no tools required. So that, that works out very, very well. The middle picture is important <clears throat> because I think for a majority of people, they don't realize that um, sensors, especially bulb uh, diaphragm type sensors can be shaken apart uh, and affected adversely by heat if they're mounted directly on the block uh, of say a, a more rough uh, secondary harmonic engine like a Ford. Um, and so it's really important to insulate some of these sensors, the older conventional diaphragm type sensors with a little bit of a flexible, um, uh, you know, braided line. And that's what we're looking at. Now, make sure you don't go too small on the braided line. Otherwise, there is a delay in the oil pressure uh, presented at the port of the sensor itself. Uh, also, if you do adapt a standard video sensor, make sure that you get the AIM harness that goes to the video sensor that has an integral dropping resistor in it. So that is really important. Um, I think, you know, Matt and I have spent a lot of time sending out sensors to people. We've gone through a bunch of different ones, uh, MSI, KA, and now AIM has brought out some extraordinarily good sensors at a very reasonable price point that are solid state. And I would recommend solid state pressure sensors for anything. And uh, that's what is pictured up on the top right. Yeah, very, very robust. The, uh, and and you, you, you mentioned here in the list that this, there's this little adapter that um, you know, our stuff is all typically it's eighth inch NPT. We, we have uh, you know, a 10 millimeter metric as well, but a lot of people here in the States, eighth inch NPT. And then the, uh, the, the Miata, especially one very, a very, very popular kit, like right here in the, you see, they always have to put on an, an adapter here at the end that takes it to that British, um, you know, BSPT, you know, thread always is, uh, you know, we have a Japanese uh, built Miata and it has a British, uh, you know, British thread, you know, pipe thread, which is uh, interesting to me. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure why the, sure. why the Miatas have that, but uh, a lot of, a lot of cars do. So make sure it's very close to the eighth inch NPT. So if you're looking into that, make sure you, the uh, uh, first time I did it, I didn't know it was there. And I was, and I was just feeling the sensors. I was trying to spin it in and it's just like, man, this just doesn't feel right. And then I did a little research and, and found it out. I needed that little adapter. So Pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff, but sensors, uh, pressure sensors, uh, maybe it's fuel, maybe it's brake pressure, maybe it's oil, but there are sensors out there, fairly easy to install and super easy to configure and, uh, and get the information that you're after. 
<laughs> there you go, Ian. Uh, uh, and other temperature sensors. You, you have a little list here of it's some kind of cool little fittings where we can put temperature sensors into. Well, you 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 picked it out on the video yesterday, and we'll you, I'll let you address that. But the idea of being able to put uh, uh, temperature sensors in existing fluid lines, like oil lines that run forward uh, in an air-cooled Porsche to a front-mounted cooler, using an inline uh, male-female uh, with a port, is a really really good idea. You can do that for transmission, differential cooling lines, stuff like that. If you don't feel like drilling into your thermostat housing uh, or making sure that the uh, thermal resistor, the, the temp sensor is being um, uh, immersed always in coolant, then uh, what you can do is stick in the uh, uh, inline in a coolant hose, a simple coupler with a port, uh, either in metric or straight thread or tapered thread. And that, that works very, very well. But just adding temperature sensors to the Smarty Cam stream can uh, pay big dividends simply by reviewing the, the temperatures at the beginning of a run and reviewing the temperatures at the end of the run. It's, it's super simple. You don't even need to open uh, the data file to see. And, and yes, uh, Robbie has hit the nail on the head. The oil temperature, this is the best <laughs> synthetic oil you can buy, buddy. He, he talks about uh, when Peter put this slide together, he talks about just adding temp sensors to your Smarty Cam can pay big dividends, right? And then I, uh, Robbie just picked out that the, the oil temperature is 511. Uh, yeah, you might want to, it's a good thing you have that in there. And now we know it. So this is a, this is, this is pretty, the car may not be moving. I'm, a, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> that was a small correction made in the, uh, the BMW PT6 uh, uh, cam protocol early on. And uh, that that's not an issue anymore. Exactly, exactly. The things we uh, that we need to to fix. A lot of you that don't have sensors, you know, t temperature in this particular slide, temperature sensors. Really, what's kind of cool about this slide is is, uh, is Peter's giving you a couple of options where you don't need to go into that that historic uh, racing engine or you know, that vintage motor or, or or some of these other cars that uh, that you just don't have maybe the tools to do. You can end up with these couplers that have have sensor ports in them, and we can uh, fairly easily tap in and get the information you need without having to drill and tap into a motor or a thermal, you know, a thermostat housing or, or whatever it happens to be. So, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty cool way of doing it. So. That's right. Okay, discrete solutions, classic race cars. I, I see this as kind of a double slide for what we're talking about here. We've been talking about loggers and uh, uh, you know, dash, dash logger solutions, right? From the Solo to the MXM, MXL2s, uh, yeah, all the different pieces. Uh, and now we're showing uh, some loggers and, and a dash, but what's really kind of cool is kind of tie it together with what we're talking about today. You know, the vintage, the, you know, a vintage race car guy, I know if I owned one, I, I want it to look and feel vintage. So I don't want a great big old color data logger that's really cool and, and, and all that and flashy lights. It just doesn't look the part, right? So having, uh, having these loggers, the Evo 4S, the Evo 4, uh, Evo 5, being able to put that down in there, maybe not have a dash sometimes, maybe put in the, the GS dash occasionally, kind of ties it all together. I, I, I like this, uh, this, this discrete solutions uh, that you have uh, given us a slide on here. Well, Again, I mean, a lot of the a lot of historic racing and vintage racing around the world and in the U.S. and it is a big part of the racing scene. Uh, it is, you know, uh, important to keep the cars looking relatively period correct. And a simple way to do that, the Evo 4S is a tiny logger, and that was my first solution in my car because I didn't have space to put a uh, display logger in in the car and uh, i it did everything i needed to do i really enjoyed it it worked out well uh, i've recently uh last couple of years upgraded to an evo 5 and uh you know because i'm adding more more sensors all the time uh, including uh izzy's strain gauge sensors really cool stuff but the the idea here is to try to put this stuff equip the car with the information logger that i need without affecting the aesthetic of the car. So very simple. And yeah, just the next step up of adding data to a car that doesn't uh, doesn't have that connection. And and of course, both of these loggers have all that analog inputs we were talking about in expansion that we were talking about in earlier a few moments ago. So pretty cool. Uh, and we're gonna kind of end this thing up with um, 
with uh, some questions if you have some more uh, and some some kind of cool pictures, right? We wanted to leave you with some slides of uh, some some of these classic race cars, these historical race cars. Uh, talk us about through a, a few of these, Peter. It's kind of uh, kind of cool to see the uh, old cool race cars so, with some data loggers in them. Well, it's a lot of fun. I mean, this uh, this is generally for U.S. racing, so we're not trying to hide anything. Uh, but these cars go all over the country. Uh, on the top left hand side, we have a, a real Shelby GT350 run by uh, some friends of mine, Cobra Automotive up in uh, Connecticut. And they uh, put a nice little GS dash with an Evo 4S uh, mounted on the center console. That's the next picture over on the right. Uh, but before you move on, I just noticed just before you move on, Peter, I just noticed something. I, I think there's a little pre data logger, pre dash edition they've had before they started. I don't know if everybody can see that, but the, he's got a stopwatch. Velcro to his <laughs> steering wheel. I didn't notice that before, so that's kind of funny. That might want that he could probably take that away now that he has his uh, GS dash on. Well, there. unfortunately, what he does is he uses that for enduro pit ah, stops. Ah, there, oh, so, there you go. So and length of racing, down, down that might be. Yeah, and, there you go. That works well. Cool. <laughs> so anyway. then uh, the other thing is that that uh, you know they've added a, a Smarty Cam GP V2.1 uh, next to their dry sump oil tank uh, in the third picture from the left on the top. Um, and then the next step is a BT-29 Brabham. This would be a, uh, a very powerful Lotus Twin Cam 1600-powered uh, 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 formula car with wide treaded tires. He has underneath that front cover where the cursor is an Evo 5. And, uh, and has he's lots got and the lots British racing green the... and a yellow stripe, I notice. Uh, yeah, you're going to see Beautiful that. <laughs> car. Absolutely stunning. Gorgeous. A Brabham BT-29. And then bottom left is a Zinc uh, Z10 from the Ford. <clears throat> this would be a vintage car. You can see the treaded tire on the front left. <clears throat> he, uh, Scott Fairchild, who has integrated a uh, Smarty Camp GP and uh, a GS Dash, uh, and as well as an Evo 4, uh, tucked above his legs in the footwell. Then on the right hand side, we have a little bit better picture of the dash, and that's okay. the only place he could put the antenna. And as long as the antenna is underneath fiberglass, and not carbon fiber, it works just great. And just to the right of that is a complete package, basically two LCU ones on the top. We have a data hub in the middle, we have channel expansion on the right, and we have an Evo 4S on the left. And uh, that is uh, Carlos Gans Boss 302. And uh, it is really, really something. Uh, but that is uh, Gary Moore's GT350 on the top left. Then on the bottom right, finishing up is a beautiful little Janetta G4. And Janetta is a great uh, sort of boutique sports car manufacturer. They've just introduced the GT Academy G55 um, car for use in this country. It's great series, but this is a G4 from 1965. And we have a little, uh, the, the shop, my friend Malcolm Mangum has uh, formed a little shelf on the outside of the cage so as not to incur on the driver compartment and you open the door and there is the Evo 4. And uh, that car also has uh, some health sensors, driver sensors, and of course the Smarty Cam, uh, which is integral to all of it. Great, great ways to sort of tuck these things away and integrate this technology in older cars. A couple, you know, two of the pictures here just show gorgeous installs, right? I mean, look at the look at the routing. Uh, every every wire also People is are spending uh, a lot of time. Is, yeah. It looks like they've got labeled and then probably clear shrink wrap over the top of those. Uh, and this one up here uh, in the upper left hand corner is is also a very very nice uh, clean install. So perfect. And you, uh, there's one more example here that you uh, that you had, uh, kind of an interesting story behind this one as we're kind of you know closing out our time here today. Yeah, just to finish up, I mean, the, the, this is a really cool setup. This was a upgrade done uh, by uh, Dave Handy, Sasco Sports, uh, John Walco, good friend of mine, uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, taking the old uh, Pi dash out uh, of this. On the rear wing on the top left, you can see from left to right an ECM uh, engine control module for the Buick V6. You can see the Pi uh, System 4 logger in the middle. And then you can see the timing beacon on the near side with a small dry cell battery. Well, we wanted to get rid of the center two. 
and uh, and sticking a, a, a MXL2 in. And we did that. It looks like it's right at home in the original place. Um, and then we have all the sensors already on the car. So we re-terminated, excuse me, we re-terminated all of the sensors uh, that we could, including the suspension pots and all of the engine health sets, excuse me, engine health sensors and everything else. And it works really, really well. And it, it worked great. Uh, but this was a, a great way to update a, a 24 year old professional top level race car, formula car to modern technology and gain the benefits of the Smarty Cam video and GPS lap timing and all the power re required to log all of the sensors that were on that car. Uh, since then, uh, we've done another uh, four more of these Indy Lights cars, wonderful cars, really quick. I mean, we're talking minute and 42 seconds around VIR and Watkins Glen. I mean, these, these <laughs> might be 25 year old cars with 450 horsepower, but they are really, really quick. No doubt about that. Perfect. Perfect. The, um, uh, just, uh, I think this is our last slide. Just, a just a few of the, some of the cars that I know you've worked on and, and worked with, uh, yeah, just a list, a, a lot of them we already actually already mentioned. So, uh, pretty cool. Yeah, what we, what you've stuck into some of these cool cars. It's fun. It's a, it's a great setup and, and I appreciate the modular, uh, modularity uh, and the customization possible with the AIM setup. Perfect. Perfect. The, um, um, I appreciate the, the, the run through here. I hope everybody got a little bit out of this. Uh, there's, there's so much information that we can get, even though the car may not have a, a great vehicle data stream. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, we talked a little bit more specifically about, uh, you know, sports cars today, but uh, uh, off-road cars, you know, uh, you know, buggies and, 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 and the, the trophy trucks and, and, and that side of it and motorcycles. And, you know, there's a, there's such a, there's such a, um, wide diverse amount of different kinds of cars that don't have uh, ECUs and, and, and uh, the, the drivers are drivers and teams are, are needing of that data. So, um, you know, you know, we did speak about it in, uh, in this way, but uh, tons of other cars as well, the same information transfers across just fine. So perfect. Oops. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit as we kind of close down. We'll go back to Peter here in a moment to kind of give us give us a bit of a wrap up. But again, we've we've talked about it. We've included lots of links over in our in our chat box. If if you're going to watch if you're watching this later on YouTube, the um, we have tons of other videos there as well, including of course this one. Well, this one will be up there within uh, within an hour or so, and uh, and all of the the links and all of the stuff that we've been talking about in the presentation materials are down in the description box. Uh, if you're watching this later on on youtube so make sure you uh if 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 peter said some things and you're watching live here today and you want to go back and take a look at it and say you know what did he, exactly did he show there take a look at a picture and look at for some install ideas uh you know, always that's why we do these things and we put them onto the uh, out onto youtube so we can go back and uh, and review them real quickly so the um uh, uh, customer support, you know, companies like Peter and, and, and all of our dealers, you know, they, we're really there for customer support. Uh, that's what, it, that's what we do here at AIM. If you have any questions, make sure you give us a call, give your dealer a call. Um, it's, it's really what we're about. We're really a, a support company that happens to sell racing electronics as, as we like to say, right? So give us a holler if you have any questions about any of the stuff we talked about today or, or, or do some searches on YouTube and, and, uh, we've done videos, uh, you know, I think this is number 80 or something like that of the, of the webinar series. So a lot of information that we've done out there for you. The, um, the next webinar, a week from today, February 16th, we're going to start at the same time, obviously. Uh, we're going to talk about Race Studio 3 analysis. Uh, our friends, uh, Emiliano in the back has been answering some questions with folks uh, in real time as we've been going here, but Emiliano will be joining us front and center as a co-host and, uh, and talk about uh, Race Studio 3 analysis. Uh, our friends in, in, in Italy have been working hard, working and working and, and continue to make uh, uh, improvements and added uh, functionality into Race Studio 3. Emiliano is going to come on and talk about it and take questions and give you an idea of where we stand with it and uh, what the next steps are. So we look forward to that. It's, uh, it's getting better and better. There are uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure even today of whether or not uh, I, I wouldn't if I if I went to a racetrack to be in a production motorsports uh, uh, an event with aim with aim hardware it I would still have race studio to a, a analysis you know, on my machine but uh, 
we're getting more and more to the point where I would be using Ray Studio 3 for, you know, some of the basic things, obviously the, the video data integration part, but for other normal data analysis, it's getting better and better. It's, uh, it's probably not ready to be released upon the world as your only, only path, but uh, we're getting closer and closer. And I know the guys are working very, very hard over in, uh, in Italy to, to continue to improve it. So continue to give your feedback and uh, we're going to talk about it uh, a week from today. In, in more depth and find out where we are. And, uh, and I know there has been a release probably three or four days ago. If you haven't updated your beta in a while, uh, jump in there and, and update that for the latest, uh, you know, some of the latest fixes that they've done. They did one that uh, is a big fix for me, I think is on its way pretty quickly. I'm not sure if it's in beta uh, yet, but uh, the XY plot, you can click on the dot in the XY plot and it uh, moves the cursor to it. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that one being released and, and out there. That, that's, uh, that's been one, of, uh, one that I've always wanted. So looking forward to that. Some contact, uh, some contact information for uh, for Peter and and uh, and uh, information of what we what we just chatted about. If you need any more, Peter's uh, information is down below. He's got PeterKraus.net. Got another website that he uh, that he handles called Go Faster Now. Those links, uh, I think, of, were in the chat box earlier, and they'll certainly be in the description below. Peter at PeterKraus.net is how you how you, how you contact Peter. Uh, my my contact information there is on the left. Um, if you have any questions about this stuff, get a hold of uh, either Peter or myself. Always uh, looking forward to chat with people. Uh, Peter, you have anything else you'd kind of like to add as we're kind of closing this one up? Nope. I just want to tell everybody I appreciate you tuning in. I want to thank all my co-presenters and colleagues out there that uh, spent a lot of time on this. And uh, Jeff Hoover, you should have your stuff this week. So <laughs> it is it is a lot of work to put these together. And, and uh, we really do uh, appreciate um, the uh, uh, folks like Peter and the other co-hosts, but certainly Peter and this one here for putting this all together. It's uh, really does provide a public service for AIM users. Uh, uh, and I did see the note there, it did, not just here in the here in North America where we are the di distributor of the products, but the world round. And we've got people watching live uh, right now from from uh, probably 10 or 12 different countries all around the world. And we appreciate you all being here. So uh, appreciate it, Peter. I appreciate all the hard work. I know it's uh, it does take a lot of time and we're all busy people. And uh, so I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for coming. I look forward to it. I look forward to um, uh, another one next week with Emiliano. Everybody have a great week and we'll see you here next uh, for the next one. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Emiliano. Thank you, Robbie. Thank Rick you, everyone. Talk to you soon.